Iora koto katoa, eta mana finua o nai tuarihi tena koto, ena ahorangi, ena pukenga, ena hoama tena koto katoa. Now my hire my kite kuru umanga. Emayana te fakatoki mata huru huru karere tamanu. Norera tena koto tena koto tena koto katoa. Good evening, everyone. I'm Paul Ballantyne, the Executive Dean of the UC Business School. And it's my privilege to welcome you all here tonight for the 2024 Conliffe Memorial Lecture. Now, as by way of my introduction, um, the first thing I did was to acknowledge the Mana Tribal Authority of this land here in Canterbury, the local sub-tribe Ngai Tua Hariri, um, of the iwi or tribal group Naitahu. The other thing I also did is welcome our professors, students, and friends to the UC Business School. Um, it is absolutely fantastic having you all here. And I also introduced what's called a whakatoki, which essentially is a Maori proverb. And the one I use translates, and it's very appropriate for tonight, I think what we have for the presentation, is it translates as knowledge empowers us as the adornment of feathers enables a bird to fly. And I think for all the Conliffe Memorial lectures I've been to over the years, that's very much is the case, where actually what we learn in terms of knowledge, everybody gains something from coming together in a room like this with the distinguished speaker that we have. So it's great having you here. The Conliffe Memorial Lecture was instituted in 2005 to honor John Bell Conliffe. In 1921, John Conliffe became the first professor of economics at what was then Canterbury University College after leaving Christchurch to serve in the New Zealand Expeditionary Force in France in World War I and studying at Cambridge University. In 1931, he joined the Economic Secretariat of the League of Nations. There he wrote the first six issues of the League's World Economic Survey. Conliffe then went on to become a professor of economics at a different UC, UC Berkeley from 1940 to 1958, and was economist of the Stanford Research Institute until 1970. Throughout his international career, Conliffe never lost his interest in New Zealand publishing New Zealand in the Making in 1930, The Welfare State in New Zealand in 1960, and a biography of his friend, Tarangi Hiroa, who was more commonly known as Sir Peter Buck in 1972. He received an honorary knighthood in 1977 for his services to the Commonwealth, and is described in the Dictionary of New Zealand as one of this country's best known international economists. The Conliffe Memorial Lecture brings leading economists to Canterbury to provide a public lecture highlighting their recent work and its relevance to the broader business and policy community. It has been held annually since 2005, with, of course, the exception of 2020 due to COVID. That year, 2020, marked the 100-year anniversary of the establishment of the Economics Department at the University of Canterbury, and of course, last year marked the 150th anniversary of this university overall. The Conliffe Memorial Lecture Series has included as distinguished speakers, world leading economists, one of whom so far has received a Nobel Prize in Economics after delivering the lecture. And that was David Card, who was the Conliffe Lecturer in 2014 and a Nobel Prize winner in 2021. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have a preeminent leader in the fields of trade policy and human his uh, sorry, economic history speaking to us. And I'd like to invite the head of our Department of Economics and Finance, Associate Professor Laurie Mary Lawoto, to introduce this year's speaker. Over to you. Thank you. Yara Koto, Ko Laura Mary Luoto, Taku Ingoa. As, as Paul mentioned, uh, my name is Laura, uh, Laura Meriluoto, or people usually call me Laura Meriluoto in this part of the world, and I'm the head of department of the uh, Department of Economics and Finance here at University of Canterbury. Before we get things underway here, let me just do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, first of all, toilets, if you need them, uh, just through the doors, um, keep on going, turn your first left and the toilet should be on your right. Um, in the unlikely, now unlikely, we didn't say the same thing a couple of years ago, um, case of emergency, um, just really um, 
uh, follow the lead of the organizers and we'll let you know what to do. There's different things that, that are applicable to different things, different emergencies. If we do need to exit the building, we'll let you know. And in that case, um, the emergency exits are directly behind you or uh, behind me and then through the doors on, on the right. And then we'll uh, gather at the uh, assembly point, which is on the grass just over there next to the Craig Road. So on behalf of the Department of Economics and Finance, I would like to really warmly welcome you to this our premier event of the year of our department. Um, as Paul already mentioned, the uh, series was officially started in, um, in 2005, although we did have public lectures that had the same um, nature even uh, years uh, before that. And actually in one of them, um, and another of such piece, speakers under my time that I've been here, which is since 2000, also won a Nobel Prize. So we've had some pretty amazing speakers over the years. Um, and I'll introduce our tonight's speaker to you shortly. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to say a few more things. First of all, lovely to see a full house here. It was a sellout. Um, this lecture um, was a sellout and it sold out on Friday. As an economist, of course, you start thinking, well, did we set the price right? Because we didn't quite clear the market. Um, so I see many um, faces uh, recognized in the audience. I see some students, I see some um, staff of, of University of Canterbury, especially the Department of Economics and Finance. I see some alumni. Um, I also see some retired staff. We've got Frank Tay in there, um, some friends of UC and our department and business school, including many industry partners that are here today. So welcome all. Um, and special welcome, I would like to make um, a special welcome to Honorable David uh, Cagle, who's um, or should I say Honorable Dr. David Cagle, because um, you know he was a, um, a um, a cabinet minister for a long time, sitting there next to um, or behind Frank Tay, um, also holds honorary doctorate from our, our uh, business school uh, from 2012. So a special welcome to you today. So now it's my pleasure to introduce um, today's speaker to you, Professor Douglas Urban, um, who's a professor or John French professor of economics at Dartmouth College in the US. Before joining um, Dartmouth, he was at the University of Chicago's Booth School of um, Business. He received his BA in political science uh, from the University of New Hampshire and PhD in economics um, from Columbia University. And he's currently the president of the Economic History Association and a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He worked on trade policy issues while on staff of uh, President Donald, uh, Ronald Reagan's um, Council of Economic Advisors, and later worked in the International Finance Division at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve um, um, Bank of, um, in Washington. He has published many articles on trade policy and economic history in books and, and in, um, in newspapers, in, in particular Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and New York Times. And of course, lots and lots of uh, professional journals, including the big hitters that we all aim for. Um, it's a bit hard. Um, journal of International Economics, Journal of Economic History, Review of Economics and Statistics, American Economic Review, and Journal of Political Economy, just to name a few. Um, he has um, 18,000 citations and age index of 60. Um, really uh, impressive um, statistics there. He's the author of Clashing Over Commerce, A History of a UC Trade Policy, a book that is a, a bestseller book um, that which The Economist um, and Foreign Affairs uh, selected as one of their best books of the year. So that's pre uh, pretty impressive. He was also awarded the Alice H. Jones Biennial Prize for the best book in North American economic history by the Economic History Association for that. And then um, the uh, Hayek Book Prize um, by the Manhattan Institute. So, um, uh, pretty amazing. He's got several other books that he, are also bestsellers, and I'm just going to mention um, two. And suddenly, um, all this um, Against the Tide and International History of Free Trade, another bestseller. And then there's the Free Trade Under Fire, which I have, I think, the first edition here. Now, onto its fifth edition, which I'm just going to leave here. I also have a pen. <laughs> just coincidentally, just in case there might be someone signing my book for me tonight. <laughs> Um, so without further ado, I, I, will you all join me in, in welcoming our distinguished speaker tonight, um, Douglas Irwin.
Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Right, do you want me to go back? All right, thank you very much uh, for attending. Um, and thank you for that very kind introduction. I do have to correct the record, however. When you use the term bestsellers uh, to discover these economic tomes, that's not the word I would use. Um, as someone said, it's probably been read by dozens. Um, so bought by a few more than that, but a lot of books get unread. Uh, but at any rate, thank you very much for the introduction. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here, particularly for a lecture series named for John Cunliffe, who I first learned about in graduate school because of his work on international economics. And of course, here he is, I guess he was the, one of the first professors of economics here uh, at, in, in Christchurch at Canterbury um, and obviously had a very distinguished career. He um, uh, actually was part of an early uh, Canterbury tradition, uh, which I've read about uh, and it's very interesting in terms of the intellectual uh, continuity that uh, takes place here. So there's a, a paper in the New Zealand Economic Papers, which I commend to you if you're interested in learning uh, more about this tradition and his role in it. Um, he was, of course, an international economist, and he uh, went to, oops, it's getting a little ahead of myself here. Uh, after um, being here, he went to the League of Nations. Um, I believe in the, uh, uh, we've established in the mid-1930s or something like that, um, which is a very propitious time. Um, obviously, the world was dealing with uh, grave difficulties in Western Europe, the rise of geopolitical tensions, the Great Depression, and he single-handedly authored a number of the World Economic Surveys, which I know I've referred to in the past and looked to in the past to try to understand this period. Uh, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Um, but then when he left for the United States, he also wrote uh, many more books. Uh, the one on the left there actually sits on my desk uh, back in the US right now, The, Con uh, the Commerce of Nations. It's a rather thick book, like uh, my most recent one, probably also a bestseller in that sense. Uh, but uh, it's a very useful reference and a way of understanding uh, the world of the time, right after World War II, the difficulties of reconstruction uh, and the difficulties that the world economy was facing. But he was always interested, not just sort of understanding and diagnosing the problems, but trying to put forward a positive agenda for the post-war world, to try to get the world economy back on its uh, feet, to restore economic prosperity, and that will be one of the themes of my uh, talk tonight as well. Um, now, it's interesting now that historians, when they go back, uh, they've applied this term neoliberalism to it. Why? Because he worked for an international organization, and some people see in the League of Nations, which uh, was designed, of course, to try to bring peace and prosperity to the world. They see nefarious means uh, and uh, uh, implications for the future, perhaps a pregenitor of the International Monetary Fund or what have you. And so uh, uh, he's been linked to this in this article here. Um, actually has this picture of him, and notice it says he's carefully caressing the globe. As if he's some, you know, globalist who's trying to, uh, you know, rearrange things in, in an a, a unfair, unequal way. Um, in fact, of course, he was just an academic trying to understand the world, trying to make it a better place. Uh, and one picture that he uh, reproduced in the World Economic Survey is on the left there. Um, he, uh, and I've looked at this uh, in, in the um, original as well, and it's a very famous picture that I'll be presenting to you a little bit later on. It's the downward contracting spiral of world trade in the 1930s. So what's interesting is month after month, for about three years, the value of world trade was just going down, down, down. Partly that was due to deflation, but also was due to the volume of trade contraction uh, that I'll talk about uh, in just a moment. <clears throat> in fact, it's precisely this sort of downward spiral that sort of uh, motivates uh, the topic tonight, which is the question of what is facing the global economy? Where are we in terms of globalization? And uh, this is just from the Financial Times pointing out that talk about deglobalization um, has hit a new high. Um, we're coming off this era of tremendous international economic expansion. And the question is, can it be sustained or are we moving in a new direction 
uh, and entering a new era of globalization. And so that's sort of uh, the, the theme that I want to pick up tonight. Are we in a new era uh, in which globalization is changing and possibly uh, some deglobalization going uh, forward? And so here are some of the points uh, and sort of the framework in which I want to uh, speak. First of all, to make the point that we are coming off of a remarkable period in human history, in terms of the global interconnections that have been established over the past two or three decades. And uh, I'll talk about that. Number two, the point is that those past drivers of globalization have stalled. So we are in a new era. Um, the question is whether it's deglobalization or just sort of uh, status quo. <clears throat> but the, the thing that's sort of, I think, uh, problematic for the world going forward is there's been a return of geopolitics very much of the type that uh, Conliffe had to deal with in his lifetime. And this has major, indeed, global economic implications, whether we like it or not. Um, and then I want to look at this through the lens of history uh, and to suggest that to understand where we are, we need to understand where we've been. And so I want to go back to the, look at the globalization of the past 200 years to try to put current decades in historical context. In some sense, I want to look at the past eras of globalization. Does that term mean anything, eras? It should bring something to mind, which is Taylor Swift's series, concert series, which is called Eras. She's going back and looking at her, her uh, life, in some sense, and the, her body of work, and her, her concerts. And I noticed she missed Aust New Zealand, um, which has created some controversy. I was just in Australia, and of course, it was incredibly wild there. Uh, because of the impact she's having. A lot of now Southeast Asian countries are very upset because she just went to Singapore and didn't go to some other countries where she has a major fan base. Um, and Singapore apparently has subsidized some of those concerts. I did read in the New Zealand press that one of the reasons she skipped New Zealand is zoning restrictions in Auckland, where the major venue there can only hold events for two or three nights. And she needs a, like four or something to really uh, you know pack in the fans. And so her team said, if I, we can't do more than two or three nights, uh, this doesn't work for us. I don't know the reason exactly why. That's just a report on social media. Um, but uh, uh, it's very interesting that, um, uh, that uh, you know, it's become politically uh, controversial in some sense what country she's going to or not. Now, you did tell some people in New Zealand, in Australia, um, that the only reason I was down there actually was not to give academic presentations, but I was actually a, a secret backup dancer for the concert. <laughs> no one seemed to buy that. Um, and uh, for, for good reasons. And anyway, history. Um, how are we to think about this? So I want to look at the level of global integration over time. I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment. Sort of the framework I, I implicitly use is one that I sort of borrow from another Nobel laureate, Claudia Golden, a professor of economics at Harvard, with her uh, husband also at Harvard, uh, Larry Katz. They've tried to explain the evolution of the skill premium over time. How much do college graduates earn more than high school graduates in the United States. That's gone up very high, it's come down, it's sort of moved over time. And what they say is there's a race between technology and education. And so what happened according to their framework is that in the 1970s and 80s, technology uh, was uh, continuing at a, a very rapid pace, but the supply of skilled workers that could work with that technology was not keeping pace. So the demand and therefore the price of skilled workers went up. Uh, but in the past, that uh, skill premium has also gone down. So how do we apply this to globalization? Well, it's in some sense a race uh, between technology and policy. So technology, always improving in some sense, is bringing us together, has that capacity. But policy can either work with that technology in bringing markets together, or it can act as a brake and a decelerator and resist uh, that process. Um, and so the question is, over time, as globalization has had its ebbs and flows, are technology and policy working in the same direction? Are they working at cross purposes? And how can we think about that to think about uh, the changes in globalization? So here's sort of the measure I want to use to sort of indicate globalization since 1825. This is a measure of world trade integration. And what it is, it's world exports and imports divided by world GDP. So how much is it of world output is getting traded? As you can see, there's ups and downs and there's different data series that all basically show the same pattern. But if you look at this, there are different eras. We can draw lines at certain demarcating certain uh, differences in terms of the uh, eras of globalization. There are five eras, as I've sort of identified here. And I just want to talk you through each of these five to talk about these last two in terms of where we are. 
So the first era there, notice um, the blue line in particular, there's sort of this gradual rise in the trade to GDP ratio. About 1875, it sort of stalls out, uh, and, but it's still rising up to World War I. So what's going on in terms of technology? What's going on in terms of policy uh, during this period here? Well, this one picture sort of sums up the technology. This is an era of tremendous technological change. So we have in the upper right there, a steamboat, probably domestic maybe in the United States, uh, up and down the Mississippi River, uh, but also that can be applied internationally. There's the railroad, which didn't increase international commerce so much, maybe in Europe, not in the United States, but what it did is it brought Midwestern produce to the ports of New York and on um, the East Coast at very cheap prices, which can then uh, lead to exports. There's the telegraph, uh, there's machinery, okay? If we go back to 1825, as the data did, that's just the beginning of the industrialization and the mechanization first in Britain, of course, then spreading around the world. Um, and so all these factors are reducing production costs and leading to lower transportation costs and therefore leading to greater economic integration. And here's some pictures just later in the 19th century. And there's a very long period of time, of course, we're talking about eight, early 1820s until 1914. So almost a century of sort of this slow but unparalleled increase in global integration. Uh, and it's not just, of course, trade. Uh, we can also talk about capital integration, telegraph abating, uh, abetting capital flows. We talk about migration, labor migration, presumably to New Zealand, uh, but also in the United States, uh, from Italy and Ireland and what have you. So all these features of globalization are firing on all cylinders. But there's also policy innovations that were pushing markets together to some extent. Um, you probably all learned that the uh, Great Britain repealed the Corn Laws in 1846. They repealed the Navigation Laws in 1849. They just sort of dismantled uh, the colonial uh, trade preferences of the British Empire in some sense. Um, and that, that was reducing, uh, opening up Britain's market uh, to world commerce. But also they pursued this one measure with other countries. This is the Cobden Chevalier Treaty of 1860. Uh, Richard Cobden there on the left, uh, Michel Chevalier, the uh, French uh, trade minister, uh, negotiated this very simple trade agreement to bring down tariffs between trade between Britain and France. Um, why did they do that? Well, Cobden tried to initiate this. <clears throat> he wasn't an economist. He wasn't thinking about uh, welfare losses and trying to minimize those or try to maximize uh, welfare gains or increase GDP. His main motivation, interestingly enough, was world peace. He was firmly committed to the idea that if you could expand commercial contacts between countries, you might be able to bind those economies together, get people in contact with one another, and lead to greater international understanding and lead to greater world peace. So here he talks about the print of free trade as a principle of gravitation uniting us in bonds of eternal peace. You might think this is sort of some naive objective, but it actually, there's a real purpose to it because if you just go to Wikipedia and say, how many times had Britain and France fought in the previous centuries? You have to go back to 1109. And basically they're just a handful of years where they're not fighting. So Britain and France are constantly fighting, putting pressures on budgets, killing people, destroying property from 1109 up to 1815. And of course, the last war, the Napoleonic Wars, had been mo the most destructive and the most costly to Britain. And he was saying, we just can't continue with this cycle. We have to do something to bring these economies together and stop this. How many times have they fought since 1815? Well, they fight all the time. That's why there's Brexit. But it's political fights. It's not military fights. Um, so yes, still friction and still misunderstandings, but uh, it, it has uh, pacified the situation to some extent. But it wasn't just this bilateral agreement. Once France reduced its tariff on British goods, other countries in Western Europe said, wait a second, now the British have an advantage. We would need access to that market as well. And so it led to is a web of bilateral trade agreements that spread all across Western Europe, reducing tariff levels. We had the formation of the Zollverein, in Germany, an internal free market. Britain reduced all internal tariffs. Yes, there were internal tariffs. Um, and then started liberalizing its external trade. Um, and this has been called the mother of all spaghetti bowls because these preferential arrangements are sort of inefficient compared to multilateral ones, but they do reduce trade costs. They did increase uh, Western European integration. Um, and as a result, that trade to GDP share rose. Now the backdrop to this, of course, the geopolitical backdrop is that up there, the British Empire. So Britain was keeping open 
world sees. They had a powerful military, was trying to keep the balance of power in Western Europe. Uh, and it's known as the long 19th century because at least in Western Europe, aside from the uh, Franco-Prussian War, it was relatively peaceful. Maybe not in the rest of the world and colonialism uh, had huge problems in India and elsewhere, but Western Europe was by and large peaceful as commerce uh, uh, increased during this period. And as you can see here, sort of uh, this trade to GDP ratio rises, but then sort of uh, uh, flattens out. Okay, now we reach the second era. Of course, this all broke in 1914 with the outbreak of World War I. Obviously, it affected uh, Condleff's life if he uh, served in the Western Front. Um, and uh, I'll come back to this a little bit later on in terms of what John Maynard Keynes had to say about all this. Uh, but it was a huge shock and blow to uh, uh, Western Europe. And what we see is the beginning of a big decline in globalization as by this measure. So for 20 years, we have these series of shocks that are pushing down global integration. So obviously World War I, wars are not conducive to commerce. Then we have the uh, monetary instability and reconstruction in the 1920s. Then we have the debt problems and hyperinflation in Germany. Then we have the Great Depression in the 1930s when uh, Conliffe was at uh, uh, the League of Nations writing about it in real time. Then we have World War II. And of course, the dislocations that caused after the war. And so what we can see is that global integration by uh, at the end of World War II, 1945, is back to where it had been perhaps even lower uh, than it had been in the 1820s. We were just starting out this process. Uh, so that uh, process uh, also occurred under the backdrop of German militarism. That is, the geopolitical situation had changed. There's no longer one country that was sort of dominant internationally now there's this power rivalry between Germany, Britain, uh, and that some of those tensions actually were uh, relevant to uh, uh, the outbreak of World War I. Um, so this is a, whoops, let's see if I have another. Oh, so what was going on in terms of technology? Telegraph, new steamships, engines. So technology is still moving to countries together, but policy was bringing them apart. Um, so the rise of protectionism, uh, in the United States in particular. So there's something called the Smoot-Hawley Tariff you might have heard about. Uh, that's Smoot and Hawley. They were members of Congress who introduced this tariff legislation in 1930 um, that raised US trade barriers. Other countries retaliated against it, started the trade war. Interestingly, economists wrote to President Herbert Hoover at the time and urged the president to veto this legislation, which is actually uh, coming to his desk before we'd entered the, the depths of the Great Depression the president uh, rejected that, signed the legislation, and the result uh, is history. And one of the results, of course, is this added downward pressure to the value of global trade. Um, once again, other countries retaliated against the U.S. Tariff levels went up, import quotas went up, um, uh, and uh, we really got a lot of protectionist measures that were counterbalanced, more than counterbalancing the, uh, the improvements in technology during this period here. Um, here's another best-selling book. Um, on uh, the trade policy disaster of the 1930s. How did we sort of get out of this mess? Well, the beginnings started in the 1930s with the election of Franklin Roosevelt as president of the United States. That sort of marked the nadir of the Great Depression and there was this recovery. But interestingly, he appointed as his secretary of state, Cordell Hull, who was sort of the Cobden of the United States. Uh, he believed in the value of free trade. And if you read his memoirs, the reason why he did is because of the experience during World War I. Uh, and he was America's longest serving Secretary of State. And you know, he didn't win a Nobel Prize in economics, but he won a Nobel Peace Prize for his work creating the United Nations. But if you look at that, legal, that Peace Prize uh, citation, it also mentions his work to reduce trade barriers and increase international cooperation over trade matters to try to restore the world economy. It actually didn't bear much fruit when he was Secretary of State. Uh, but this is a representative statement uh, by him. I will never falter in my belief that the enduring peace and welfare of nations is very much connected to the maximum practical degree of international trade. So once again, he wasn't an economist. He didn't think about welfare loss triangles or efficiency necessarily, but he thought that we need more commerce to create jobs and we need more commerce to bring countries together to, uh, in an effort of international understanding. So he uh, steps down in, whoops, 1944. 
He had tried to reach some of these bilateral agreements in the 1930s, and he did some, but didn't really have much of a big economic impact. But as head of the State Department, he got the whole U.S. government behind this idea that after World War II, we need to get countries together to cooperate on international economic matters. So uh, here's a little plug for my home state of New Hampshire. Uh, you might have heard of the Bretton Woods Conference, which established the IMF and the World Bank. That was held uh, about two hours from where I live and where Dartmouth College is in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. It was held at the Bretton Woods uh, Hotel. Yes, we have sheep in New Hampshire too. Um, this is the way it looked in 1944. Um, didn't need lawnmowers or anything. Of course, there's no golf course or anything. Um, and this is the way it looks today. There's a golf course and they mow the lawn. They don't have the sheep out there, but uh, it's right at the base of Mount Washington, which is uh, right there, the highest peak in the Northeast. Um, and there's a cog railway which goes up there. So if you ever happen to be in the Boston or New England area, it's a very nice place to visit, spectacular hikes, nice views, uh, and what have you. And you can see the room where they signed uh, the, the Bretton Woods Agreement. You can see the room where they negotiated uh, those agreements. That's on the monetary side. Um, but what about the trade side? What about commerce? Here, once again, is just a statement of Frank President Roosevelt uh, right after the end of the war, saying we cannot succeed in building a peaceful world, world unless we build an economically healthy world. So this was the animating idea behind the United States getting involved in international commerce to try to uh, free, up, uh, free it from uh, the chains of protectionism. His successor, Harry Truman, said exactly the same thing. At this particular time, right after the war, the world is concentrating much of its thought and energy on the objectives of peace and freedom. These objectives are completely bound up with a third objective, the reestablishing world trade. In fact, the three, peace, freedom, and world trade are inseparable. The grave lessons of the past have proved it. Very much a Cobbenite idea coming right after a major world war, just as Cobden had been writing after uh, the Napoleonic Wars. Here's a stamp from the United States at the time expressing this attitude. Once again, it wasn't as though economists were running the show. This is coming from the State Department, the President of the United States for foreign policy reasons. Um, here's a political cartoon from the Washington Post. And what we have here is trade freedom, holding up political cooperation, holding up peace, world peace. And who's off, off stage? The tariff lobbies that don't really want free trade, that don't want their tariff reduced, and are shooting peas at trade freedom, trying to dis disrupt trade freedom. And the idea at the time is we have to resist those lobbies, we have to resist those domestic interests that don't want to open because we'll jeopardize much more important objectives if we uh, do so. And so the United States took the lead in establishing something known as the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which has morphed into the World Trade Organization today getting countries around the table to negotiate about trade policy, to come up with a set of rules and establish a benchmark for uh, uh, how we can reestablish world trade. And what that led to is if we look in this period from say 1950 to 1975 or so, is a restoration of world trade. But notice it's a partial one. I'll make two points about what we have here. Um, first of all, there is this jump up in the early 1970s. What else happened in the early 1970s? Oil price shocks. So a lot of this big jump is not some increase in globalization. It's the fact that all of a sudden countries have to pay a lot more for oil. And so the value of world trade goes up because the cost of, of those goods went up. It's not really an increase in the volume of, of trade in, in that sense. But notice where we were right up before the oil shocks, we were, certain, we were not up to the peak of 1913. It was a very partial globalization. Now, sometimes the GATT is called part uh, of the multilateral uh, framework. But it was a very partial mu uh, multilateralization at this time. The world was really divided after World War II into three worlds. The first world, the second world, and the third world, as they're commonly known. And I know for the students today, this is just doesn't make any sense. But the, the world was truly divided up. Uh, we have the blue countries, sort of Western democracies, that believed in Capitalism, if we will, market, market oriented societies, private enterprise, um, and freer trade. There was the second world in red, the communist world. Well, they didn't believe in markets, they didn't believe in trade, and it's very hard that when you have a state trader and a market oriented economy to interact. So there just wasn't a lot of trade between the first world and the third, second world. 
uh, China was completely uh, closed off. Their trade to GDP ratio was something like 2% of GDP. Then we have the third world, sometimes called the global south, non-aligned countries, which didn't want to choose sides so much, and were protecting domestic industries from foreign competition through import substitution policies. That is, they thought the way to get rich was to industrialize. That meant you had to produce your own manufactured goods. You wouldn't want to import them and just export commodities. And so they tried indigenous industrialization through high trade barriers. So they didn't trade much with the global north as well. So this globalization that was taking place was very partial. It was only really the blue countries that were integrating. Um, the rest of the world remained separate uh, from it. Um, and yet, uh, whoops, whoops, sorry. And yet what happened? Another transition. And the world, this, this here, this is from 1985, but it applies to 1987 as well. And just a few years later, what had happened? The entire sort of world map was changed. And we had sort of one world, one global market. Notice we don't have those red countries anymore. The, so the uh, Soviet Union collapsed, the Berlin Wall fell, Eastern Europe was integrated with Western Europe, China opened up, Vietnam opened up, the global south went through this period of opening up their markets as well, giving up on import substitution industrialization. Everyone's a member of the WTO, um, and that leads to this other era. Um, but let me just say uh, one, one thing about this period right here first before we get to that new transition, you can see it jumps up. But, and the reason why it's only a partial jump up is that top picture, which is geopolitics. The world was fragmented politically and therefore it could not be unified economically. It was fragmented economically as well. But this period here now, what we see is this is uh, between you know, 1986 or so, 88, 90, uh, and then uh, the great financial crisis is this incredible um, growth in the value of world trade compared to GDP. That's that globalization that era. That's when the geopolitics changes. And that's where I just want to stop for a moment and think about what was the technology, what were the policy measures driving that incredible period of globalization uh, that we've seen until recently. Well, once again, it's both things operating in the same direction. Unlike the interwar area where they're operating opposite one another, they're both working in the same direction. So tremendous declines in transportation costs and new innovations in technology bringing markets together, and then policy measures, unilateral and multilateral efforts to bring down uh, those trade barriers. So here's just uh, transport costs from 1965 to 2014. And they're going down on the magnitude of 30, 40, 50%. That's a force to bring markets together. And of course, there's technology behind that. What's the technology? Well, think about the old technology and then think about the new technology, moving commodities, moving bulk goods. Barrels and bags, wheat, um, liquors, uh, oil, what, whatever you have, you this is a very costly, labor-intensive way of moving goods across markets. How do goods get moved today? You see it, you see it right here in your own harbors. Uh, containers, um, which are dramatic uh, reductions in the cost of moving uh, goods. Um, in the United States, we just lift these right off. They go right onto the back of a railroad truck and go off to different markets. They go in the back of a, a, a truck, off they go. Uh, it's incredibly cost reducing. Um, so we have these huge ports. Don't have all these people uh, you know, moving barrels and bags. It's There's one crane operator. Maybe even that could be automated and just automatically pulls these things off at incredible speeds. Now, of course, with great technology comes great risks as well. And so sometimes this can happen uh, where those containers get uh, flopped around if they're not locked down. The most famous incident in which some of these containers have been pitched overboard is the great rubber duck debacle of, of 1992, when a container containing rubber ducks from Hong Kong going to uh, Los Angeles um, tipped over, spilled all these rubber ducks. There's an economic loss, but a gain for oceanographers because they got to track where all the currents were going. And 15, 20 years later, they're still showing up on the shores of Western Europe having traversed the Arctic Circle. Of course, they came down here to Australia and New Zealand much more quickly, um, which you might have been walking the beaches and seen these rubber ducks show up, um, but the ocean current sort of stirred them up and took them all over uh, the world. If you're interested in this, there's a whole book. Now, this is probably a bestseller, not an economics film. This might be a bestseller, 
uh, Moby Duck about uh, all these uh, duckies lost at sea. An interesting topic. Uh, so that's one con uh, idea of behind containerization, but uh, another one. Here. So here are cars. Notice what you see, one by one. This is 1971. For the students in the room, this seems like ancient history. For me, it seems like yesterday. A little bit longer than that, but still, a lot of people, one by one, moving cars off. What does that do to the price of a car? This is what they have. We have. This is how Kia, Toyota, Honda, all these car manufacturers. Sometimes they own their own ship. And it's a ship just devoted to the transport of automobiles. And they're driven on and driven off. And the cost per car is pretty low. But as I mentioned, sometimes there can be problems here. If you don't load them correctly, Kia lost 2,000 cars by uh, having their uh, ship go through a storm or it wasn't loaded properly or what have you. Um, and how you write this, I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, so new technologies, yes, sometimes it doesn't work out so well. But in general, it's a huge cost-saving uh, device. So that's on the technology. On the policy side, too, major changes in trade policy. So what this is just a picture of the number of countries that, according to some economists, have flipped from being closed to being open. And what you see is a few in the 60s, almost no one in the 70s and early 80s. And then from 1985 to 1995, a wave, country after country, opening up. And of course, some of this is Eastern Europe, some of it is Latin America, uh, some of it is even down here and elsewhere, countries uh, opening up their markets, um, uh, not in concert with one another, uh, often unilaterally. So tariffs, tariffs come way down. Tariffs are just taxes on these imported goods. Um, in advanced countries, tariffs are relatively low, once again, because of the GATT and other measures. But they came down dramatically in the 1980s and 90s uh, all around the world. And of course, what does this do? That increases world trade, which is why we see during this period here, this tremendous growth in the trade to GDP ratio, going far beyond what we saw in 1913, right before uh, World War I uh, broke out. So I just want to pause for a moment to reflect on that period, that 20 year period from 1985 and 2005 or so, right before the financial crisis. It's only 20 years but it's historic. It changed the course of world history in this way. Here's the income distribution around the world in 1800, pre-industrial revolution, pre-openness to trade. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's an international poverty line there. And basically the whole distribution of world income is to the left of that poverty line. It's not quite Thomas Hobbes uh, life is um, you know, mean, brutish, and short, but a lot of poverty. Basically, everyone's impoverished. Everyone's working in agriculture. And if you have a bad harvest, you're toast. Then we have the Industrial Revolution. And what we see is world income distribution becomes bimodal. So some countries have gotten richer. They've industrialized Western Europe, North America, and elsewhere. But the bulk of humanity is still to the left of that international poverty line. They're left behind. There's been a separation. It's a bimodal distribution. There's rich countries and poor countries, first world countries, third world countries. And that's the way the world is over that 175 year period. Now let's take this from 1975, and I'm not sure where the next slide will be, probably 2005 or so. What happens in that short 20, 30 year period? What happens to this distribution of income? First of all, there are many in the US that fear globalization saying, gosh, our living standards are so high. There's what? There's a race to the bottom. So we're gonna sl slide down below that international poverty line because we can't compete with cheap labor elsewhere. But there was another story which says, oh, if technology spreads and, te and, and markets spread, um, you can actually move those people up uh, beyond the international poverty line. Uh, oh, well, before I get there, what's going on here between 18, uh, 1800, 1975, In, inequality is going up. Some countries are moving ahead. Some countries are sort of languishing where they were. And so this is just a measure of the Gini index for the world starting in 1820 and ending in 2018. Uh, well, I'll stop at 2000 here. And you can see the world's going one way. Some countries are moving ahead. Some countries aren't moving at all. Inequality is increasing. 
And that led to the development economist to write in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, an article maybe assigned in some of the classes, divergence big time. There's no convergence of the world economy, it's divergence. But when was this article published? 1997. Okay, so it was probably written in 1995, maybe, based on data that ends in 1990. Well, what happened in 1989? The world changed. The world came together. And we stopped having this divergence big time, and we started having, whoa, what happened to world income distribution? First of all, it's uniform. It's, a, it's now a single motive uh, distribution. Many more people moved to the right moving above the international poverty line. And yes, there's the, the yellow countries, which are Europe, um, but really the red, red is Asia and the Pacific, has moved up and to the right, out of poverty to much more normal distribution. Because I showed you that picture, if everyone's a member of the WTO, if everyone's sort of on the same page in terms of being open to investment, open to markets, you get this convergence process because technology is going to move. Uh, here's just uh, this based on work by Branko Milanovic, both the previous slide and, the, and this one. Uh, you can look him up. This is just looking at income distribution globally, 1988, 2011, 2018. You can see in 1988, it's that bimodal, and it becomes more uniform and then shifts to the right between 2011, 2018, and what have you. And so what has happened is, whoa, this is that picture on global inequality I just showed you, updated. And once again, the small period here, there's a decline. In 20 years, it erased a century's worth of increasing global inequality. That's an astounding period in human history. I mean, this is two centuries, two centuries of data. Last 20 years, we get that change. It's completely off where we had been going as a world, and it's been completely revolutionary. Uh, just this morning, the United States has released a paper by the National Bureau of Economic Research, a leading uh, outfit that produces uh, uh, economic research. And um, I haven't read the paper yet, but the findings are astounding. Um, there's underreporting of income by the bottom 50% of the world income distribution. So basically all those pictures that I showed you, they're misleading because they're underreporting income at the lower levels of the income distribution. And what they find, they reconfirm the findings of the literature that global poverty and inequality have declined dramatically between 1980 and 2019. We find that within country inequality is falling on average and has been largely constant since the, since the 1990s. So there's this narrative out there that, okay, maybe global inequality has gone down, but within a country inequality has gone up. In certain countries, yes, but not. it's not a general finding that in some countries in, within country inequality has been falling as well. Uh, and here's some pictures that I've just taken from that paper, which you can download from the internet. And once again, you can see in the mid 1990s or 2000s or so, all of a sudden these Gini coefficients start moving down. All sorts of different ways you can measure uh, income, di different surveys, uh, all pointing in the same direction. Which country is this? Pardon me? India? India? Bangladesh? Any other countries? Pardon me? Cambodia? Could be. Uh, it's actually, this is a, take, a picture taken in 1965 by a friend of mine, now quite elderly, who was appointed to represent the United States in terms of economic affairs in Korea. This is Seoul, Korea in 1965. What are the people doing? They're washing their clothes in the river in downtown Seoul. What does South Korea export today? We buy them too. Washing machines. So within the span of one generation, South Korea has gone from washing clothes in the river in the major capital city to exporting washing machines that now have more than flooded the domestic market, and now they're exporting competitively in international markets. This is a picture of Seoul in 1960. This, soul, this is not some remote village. This is the capital. And of course, here's that same river today. Once again, this is astounding. This is astounding. Um, I can show you slide after slide of different countries, yes, Cambodia, Vietnam, elsewhere. And then I show my town where I live now, Hanover, New Hampshire. I show that in 1950 and today. And guess what? 
You can't tell the difference. <laughs> There's no change. You know, the, the same deli shop is there, the same bookstore is there. It's just, you know, so some places change fast and it really caught up and other places just have not changed at all. Um, and of course, this is Seoul. Uh, and I just picked out Korea because it's the most dramatic. It's an outlier, yes, of course, because they've done dramatically well. But it's just this process is, has begun to happen over the last 20 or 30 years in other countries as well. We'll see how far they go. Here's global poverty, not in terms of the poverty rate, but in terms of the number of people behind some benchmark for what world poverty is. Once again, East Asia and the Pacific, and once again, largely China, but it's not only China. It's been Korea and uh, uh, Vietnam and other countries as well have squeezed out, brought hundreds of thousands of people uh, uh, out of poverty. Somewhat in South Asia, because India began to reform in 1991, and India is doing pretty well now, um, reducing poverty. The one region of the world that is underglobalized, hasn't seen these benefits so much yet, is Africa. And of course, the populations are going there uh, dramatically, but the, po uh, but the I mean, poverty rates have come down, but the sheer number of people, the number of people in poverty um, has been stubbornly high. Here's just a way to think about global poverty. So here we are in 1993, just as these changes are beginning to take place. And this is, of course, where the global poor are. And so you can almost tell which where the big part of the story is. So this is 1993. Let's fast forward 20 years. What does this look like? It's global poverty. Once again, East Asia, huge strides, including Indonesia. India is smaller. Africa, not so much progress, whoops. Uh, some progress in Latin America, um, but just this shrinkage of global poverty as incomes have gone up, as they've been integrating, getting better technology and what have you. So th that period is sometimes dismissed as this neoliberal era, but it's historically unique. We haven't seen anything like it since the time of Adam Smith. Impressive global growth, convergence, poverty reduction. There always has to be a catch. What's the catch? What was going on between 1990 and global financial crisis? Geopolitics. China was just focused on getting rich, not throwing its weight around its Asian backyard. Russia just wanted to stabilize. Didn't have the means or the hopes of invading a neighbor. But now we're in a ge different geopolitical world. And so th what that means is that the world's going to be fragmenting and it's in a different, uh, different place. So there's this, uh, you know, making a unipolar moment. It's sort of like not quite 19th century Britain, but there was no power that challenged the United States. Those that could were, once again, focused on other things. But the global financial crisis sort of marks this high water point high tide of globalization. We see it go down, it does come back up, but then it's been flat since. And we are in a different era today. And so the question is, what does this era bring and what is the future going to hold for us? Well, first of all, a friend of mine in Washington, uh, an old economist, uh, Herb Stein, once said, if something can't go on forever, it will stop. And that applies to globalization too which is why this thing is sort of stopped. Do we expect that to go up forever? It, you know, it's, it's 60, is it gonna to go to 90? It can go over 100 because Singapore has a traded GPU share for technical reasons, but uh, we wouldn't expect this to go on forever. It's gonna naturally tail off at some, some uh, point. And so for example, think of the containers. So containers were sort of invented in the 1960s, really introduced in the 1980s and 90s. We see the payoff in the 90s and the 2000s. What's next? Okay, we sort of tapped out, we're done with containers, got the efficiency. I don't know what's next. Um, air freight, okay, we've done that, unless we're gonna do it supersonic or something, you know, we've sort of tapped out with that too. And so uh, we took tariffs way down. So if you're India and you start out in 1990 and your tariffs are 90% and you bring them down to 20%, trade's gonna boom. Okay, you're at 20%, you bring them down to 10%. That's okay. That's going to integrate markets more, but it's not the same margin. It's not the same effect. So a lot of uh, there should be have been an expected slowdown in globalization um, because both technology and policy 
we're sort of, we've, we've tapped out of those. But then there's a lot of unexpected shocks. So the first one, of course, is the global financial crisis, which discredited the US model in many places, most importantly in China. I think about China as being this monolith, but there are factions in China. And there was a pro-Western faction that was thinking we ought to be more like a Western-oriented economy. And guess what? They couldn't say that anymore after the global financial crisis. Look what happened to uh, that country. That's not a model anymore. We have to move in a different direction. President Xi is uh, appointed not too long after that. And we have the US-China trade war. We have the pandemic. We have Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We have national security concerns over uh, semiconductors. We're worried about supply chains in the United States. Um, you know, uh, the United States is now in the process of dismantling all those cranes I showed you. Where do they come from? China. Guess what the US is doing now? Dismantling them all. Why? Well, there's other cranes. We're still going to have cranes, but if there's if there's Chinese software, uh, we, there's national security concerns. So let's say we as economists say, gosh, those cranes, they're so efficient. And then someone from the national security agencies say, guess what? They're a threat to our, they monitor our data. They can shut down. They may be controlled in Beijing. Who's going to win that argument? Well, the United States, very security conscious, out the cranes go. So there's going to be a cost there, but that's, uh, and then semiconductors, not letting in electric vehicles, partly for protectionist reasons. We don't want to disrupt the jobs of our workers, but also they've said it quite explicitly. Uh, who's going to be driving that car? What do we know about the chips that's embedded in there and the sleeper uh, viruses and what have you? And what happens if car crashes go way up? We can't let those cars in. Um, so all of a sudden, there's been a change in priority. So but first, let's just do uh, COVID first. Um, people thought this might be the end of globalization, spread of disease and what have you. If you look at the volume of world trade, it did fall just as much as it did during the Great Recession, 2008, 2009. But guess what? Within 10 months, it's basically back up to where it was before. So that was a temporary shock. We, we went through COVID very, very quickly. The uh, global financial crisis took uh, almost two years to get back to where we had been in terms of the volume of world trade. This is the real clash. This is the geopolitical crash, which is clash, which is separating markets uh, to some extent. Um, and from the US perspective, and I won't presume to speak about uh, New Zealand or Australia or, or any other country, I'll just reflect what I've learned uh, being in the United States. Um, you know, they view China as a threat. It's an economic threat. They don't play by the same rules. They don't even want similar rules. Um, I can go through the litany of complaints. China doesn't play fair with its state-owned enterprises, and even its private firms get this free capital from state-run banks. There's no accounting in terms of uh, no profit and loss. You, know, if you just roll over the losses, the government will bail you out. How can you have a private firm which has a budget constraint and a profit constraint compete with a firm that has unlimited capital and creates excess capacity? Uh, and, and is, is not state-run necessarily, but uh, the state is backing them uh, behind them. It, it's thought it's fundamentally incompatible. And it's partly uh, US, China's, uh, U.S. views of China have changed because China's changed. So we're not in the Deng Xiaoping era of liberalization going for markets. Um, as Nick Lardy says in this book, uh, the state has stepped back in. Partly after global financial crisis, but maybe even before then, here's from the New York Times. She's uh, post uh, uh, virus strategy. China looks inward. Indigenous innovation, dual circulation, all these buzzwords about separating their economy, becoming a technological uh, leader. And of course, there's that political fragmentation that comes with it in terms of uh, um, uh, different views on, on international issues. Uh, this is just UN voting on whether to condemn Russia for the invasion of Ukraine. Now, I showed you that map of membership of the World Trade Organization, where sort of everyone's a member. That does not imply that everyone's on the same page in terms of global politics. So, yes, there's countries that were willing to condemn Russia. But a lot of countries said, particularly in the global south, guess what? That's not our fight. And we're not going to pick sides between the West and the East. Um, we're going to just remain neutral. Well, that harkens back to that that bifurcation in the world politically uh, before the end of the Cold War. And as a result of all these concerns about national security, concerns about different politics and, and economics, there's from the IMF, the number of protectionist trade measures 
once again, since 2018 or so has been going up. Um, so protectionism is on the rise. Um, and so what we're going to see in some sense is trade being less of an engine for growth, trade less a force for global equality because protectionism brings with it inefficiency and cost. And you can't have a political fragmentation of the world without having an economic fragmentation too. And that's exactly what we're seeing bilaterally between the US and China. And, um, and other countries are gonna have to choose where they wanna be on that spectrum. So this is just that, remember I showed you those, uh, uh, the global inequality falling and that convergence process. So what you can see is around 2000, this is just the, the deviation of, of uh, GDP across countries. That deviation is falling, but since about 2015 or so, it sort of stalled. So that process of convergence is sort of stopped for the past uh, 10 years or so. So this chart here, as the new data comes in, we go forward, is it gonna fall the way it's fallen there? Maybe not. Maybe it's just gonna flat level and plateau and the next five or 10 years of, of data will be uh, flat there. Here's just a, a picture from a recent um, International Monetary Fund uh, document, which is putting together various estimates of what happens. What's the cost of various fragmentation? So there's trade fragmentation with sectoral misallocation, um, strategic de decoupling, decoupling in electronics only, and the picture is uh, upper and lower bound. And once again, the numbers don't matter. These are all models and based on assumptions, what have you, but everyone is negative. And it ranges from 1% of world GDP up to about 8% of world GDP. One to eight. So like the forecasters saying, I don't know how many inches it's gonna rain, but we know it's gonna rain. We don't know what, how big the costs are gonna be, but we know there are costs. If you integrate markets and there are gains, if you separate markets, there are costs. Just think about the Brexit debate in Britain. You join the European Union, you get access to all sorts of markets. Now you may wanna separate from the EU for political reasons or what have you, but do not tell us that you're gonna be economically better off from separating from Europe. That dividend did not appear. And now the Brexiteers are trying to explain it saying, well, it still worked out because at least we're not under the rule of Brussels anymore. Fine, but to sell it as an economic winner that your GDP is gonna go up is a hard, hard sell. Uh, this is from the World Trade Organization, looking at country by country. Um, who's going to bear the cost of this decoupling? Is the U.S. going to bear the cost? Not much. Why not? Trade's a small share of our GDP. We're a big economy. Trade's important for the world, but it's a small part of the overall U.S. economy. So that's why the U.S. can so easily say to Western Europe, oh, sanction Russia over their invasion of Ukraine. We're gonna do the same thing too. Well, we're just not integrated with Russia that much. It's not gonna cost us much. We're asking a lot of our European allies. So what happens when the Secretary of State comes to uh, New Zealand and Australia and says, guess what? We don't like China and you shouldn't either. Don't trade with them so much. Because we're not. Well, is it costing the US anything? There's some cost. We're just importing stuff from Vietnam now or Mexico, um, but it's gonna affect you a lot more. Um, so look at Russia is going to be affected, India, China, other developing countries, and the numbers are much larger. Once again, they're just numbers, but the direction is the thing that's important. Um, I don't, haven't seen any estimates of the cost of the trade war for on the New Zealand economy, but for Australia, it's, it's thought to be up to 6% of GDP. That doesn't mean that where you are now, boom, your income goes down 6%, but that's shaving 6% off of what, the path that you would have been. So maybe you won't be any poorer 10 years from now, but you could have been 6% richer. It's taking that thing off the path uh, that you're on. So just talking about what's happening in the US, what's the U in the US, it's not a partisan issue anymore, it is bipartisan. President Biden hasn't really changed the policies from President Trump in terms of trade. Um, the view is China's a major economic threat. There's a change in priorities, all that stuff about world peace, that's out. Okay, trade doesn't lead to peace. People in the Biden administration will say this. Uh, it leads to international friction because China comes up and they, be, they want to exert their power. So changing priorities. Geopolitics is more important than the economics. Security is more important than efficiency. 
So if we have to replace those Chinese cranes with more expensive cranes that don't work as well, got to do it. Uh, and importantly for New Zealand, no interest in the rules-based order that was codified in the WTO saying, look, we're not going to agree on trade all the time, but here's the basic rules and here's a dispute settlement system to resolve disputes based on those rules. Here's what President Trump wrote in his own hands. This is by Bob Woodward, an investigative journalist famous for Watergate in the United States. One of his books, he's very well sourced. Notice he didn't want to just put in, oh, I, I read a document where President Trump said trade is bad and type that out. He said, oh, let's take a copy of what the president wrote in his own hands to show you this is what the president thinks. This is not what his advisors are telling him. This is what he thinks. And we are very close to a second Trump term. Trade is bad. Um, so the WTO rules out the window. Um, hearts don't beat faster for the rules-based international order. This is from the Financial Times. So, okay, you're appealing to some higher objective here, writing down rules. No, we're in a world of geopolitics and, and uh, big power politics. Rules go out the window. We want to subsidize our electric vehicles industry. We're going to do it. If there are rules against it. Doesn't matter. Rules based order is quietly disintegrating. Wall Street Journal. WTO ought to be abolished. There's a senator, a Republican senator. Republicans used to be the pro trade party in the United States. Well, first of all, this just shows ignorance because the w US cannot abolish the WTO. Okay, we're a member of the WTO, but if we walk away, it doesn't, it's not abolished. So the US can't be, we can't abolish the WTO. We can walk away from it. And in a second Trump term, there's a danger of that, as there's a danger of the US walking out of NATO. Um, China's plan to reshape trade on its own terms is from the Financial Times. Uh, China's also ready if the WTO sort of just becomes a nothing entity. Um, they're getting their own trade agreements, they're getting their own house in order to, so that their trade will continue uh, even in a post-WTO world. So if we're not in a rules-based order, what sort of order are we in? We're in a power-based order. And that's where the US and China will tell its trading partners, whose side do you want? Who do you want to trade with? And if we ban Huawei, you better do so too, because we're not gonna trust goods coming from you if they involve some electric components or what have you. And just that once again means that national security domestic interests are more important than efficiency considerations. And before we wrap up and go to Q and A, let me just say, is there any glimmer of good news here? There's a little bit. First of all, I showed you that the trade to GDP ratio had sort of topped off. There had been some fears that it actually was going to go down, continue to go down. It hasn't gone down. In fact, some economists have argued, parsing out the data, that actually it shows it's flat. But if you look at services trade, digital trade, a lot of other areas of trade, it's actually going up. And there's been some deflation in the price of commodities, so that it's pushing that thing down. So reduced integration, maybe it, there's questions about the data. Maybe it's going up a little bit, but certainly it's not going up the, at the pace it had been before, but we, we can debate that. Second point is it's actually really hard to unravel globalization. So when we start out with very high trade barriers, getting rid of those barriers is really hard because you have vested interests that don't want to change and you're promising some new different world. Now we're in a world of very high levels of integration. And now you say, want to say, we're going to take that away from people. That's very hard. So President Trump wanted to leave NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, wanted to say no free trade with Mexico. I won't tell you what he called them. No, nope. but did he do it? No. Why? Because ah, the farm sector actually exports a lot to Mexico. The auto industry is very heavily invested and in, in there's a lot of two-way trade. So all, President Trump's advisors said, look, you can pull out of NAFTA, but your constituents, it would hurt your constituents the farmers in the Midwest and the auto, automakers that actually be worse off. And so we backed away. So we're in this level of high integration and pulling away from it is difficult precisely because as we've seen with Britain, there are costs to disintegration. So Apple says, we want to disinvest from China. Well, they don't put it that way. They say, we want to diversify where we're producing. We produce 100% of our iPhones in China. That's too much because if there's a trade war, it may get cut off. Guess what their plan is for five or 10 years from now? What percent Going from 100, where are they going to be in terms of China, in terms of iPhones? 90%. <laughs> That's their big diversification plan. 
uh, it's really hard to avoid that advantage of China. And so you've integrated the world, pulling it apart is very, very difficult. And the rest of the world continues to move on and wants trade. Uh, and doesn't want to buy into the, the protectionist movement so much. So Africa, I mentioned that least globalized region, they just signed a continent-wide free trade agreement. I always raise questions about the quality of the agreement, whether it's going to actually have an impact, but that's the direction they are looking to go. Um, and then uh, trade and peace, we can come back to that. So in sum, where are we? I would say that the 20-year the period from... Roughly 1990 to 2010 is a unique, remarkable period in human history that we have basically lived through and we take for granted. That we've passed this inflection point where globalization is now, I wouldn't say it's in retreat, I'd say it's attenuated. It's not growing the way it used to be, but it's at risk of uh, more deglobalization, but that's dependent on geopolitics, not so much on technology and policy. Um, so the geopolitics is a geo, is a fragmenting force, and the future much depends on China. So they've been, had been on this liberalizing path, this more liberal path, and they've moved on a different path with President Xi. There will be a post Xi era, and the question is, are they going to go back? Because if the economy is not doing so well, maybe they're going to think we need to get back to international commerce once again, or it could be they just go for more repression and more being closed, and and, and we just don't know. And so I'll just sum, around, sum up with uh, this uh, quote from uh, Gideon Rockman of the Financial Times who said, for all the discontents that hyperglobalization has created, I suspect that period, uh, period in the decades to come, this period will come to be seen as a golden age of peace and prosperity. The world may soon discover that globalization is the worst possible system apart from all the alternatives. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions you might have.